Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. We will let a few more people get tuned in and then we will get started. While we're waiting, use the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. If you've watched these before, you know how much I love this part. Los Angeles, hello, Trent. Minneapolis. Tacoma, hello, La Jolla. Ballard. Oh, Esther, hi. Joplin, Missouri. I grew up in Southern Illinois, which probably doesn't sound like it's close to Joplin, Missouri, but I feel that like, you know, small town kinship. Queen Anne, Pinehurst, hello, Newport Beach, California. Oh, Peoria, Illinois, yeah. Oh my gosh, Peoria. You have family there. San Francisco, Ventura, hello from Maine. Oh yes, hello, Alexander. Philly, hello, hello. We have a lot of people signed up tonight, so I'm gonna give it just a few more seconds and then I will do those introductions. Brooklyn, oh, I love this. Thank you everyone for sharing where you're tuning in from. It's so much fun. Mount Baker in Seattle. Hello, Helen. Vancouver, BC. I can't wait to get back to BC. I was just discussing that with someone the other day. <laughs> Wally Mott. Yeah. All right. We are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Lara Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop here in Seattle, Washington called Book Larder. We are doing some in-person cooking classes and author talks, but um, we are still doing talks on Zoom. And I think that it's something we, we, we will continue to do even when masks are never necessary and we're not all worried about when we can get a booster shot again and things like that. Um, it just allows us to do really great conversations like the one tonight where the author's in one city, the interviewer's in another, I'm here, You'll, you're tuning in from all over the world and I see someone from South Korea has joined us. Um, and so I, you know, we can just take a, a positive thing from all we've been through over the past two years and we'll keep gathering like this once in a while. So thank you for joining us tonight. I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Eric Kim. He is a New York Times writer and now author of this fantastic new book, Korean American, Look at that cover, right? Like you just want to open it and start cooking from it. Um, he is going to discuss the book tonight with novelist Alexander Chi. They are going to obviously talk about the book and they will leave time for questions. So if you can please use that little QA button at the bottom of your screen, if you have questions, that will make it easier for Alex and Eric to sort of see where those are. Use the chat to talk to each other and then use that Q&A if you have questions for them. Eric was kind enough to sign a whole lot of book plates for us, and so if you order it from us, which so many of you have done already, thank you for that, you will get a signed copy, and I will drop a little link into the show notes, or the show notes, I just said show notes, it's not a show, into the chat for you, um, and um, yeah, we ship all over the world, so um, the link will be there. And um, we are also recording the conversation and it will be posted to our YouTube channel within the next probably 48 hours or so. So you can um, finish up watching it if you have to drop off early, share it with friends, whatever you'd like afterwards. All right, so enough of me. Let's turn things over now to Alexander Chi and Eric Kim. <laughs> yeah. Hello. That was really good timing. We just like, bam. It was simultaneous, yes. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm really excited to talk to you about this book. Uh, I feel like I've been having conversations with you in my head a little bit about it. Um, uh, but even as uh, the night came closer, the questions got a little more specific and I realized where I wanted to start, which is uh, you know, I think one of the most beautiful things about the book is the way in which it emerges out of this conversation with your mom. Um, and is so, uh, so much a part of like, how do you make this kind of a conversation? But, 
I'm just gonna say it. Um, a lot of uh, Korean moms don't give their secrets up very easily. So I'm curious about whether, if you want to talk at all about like what that, whether there was any initial resistance from her. Um, yeah. And how you might have overcome that. And my mom is not easy to get things out of. Um, there's a line in the very second essay of the book. Some, oh, that's my dog drinking water. Sorry. <laughs> you. This is the benefit of being being home. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, you know, the, the line is something like, um, actually, I have in front of me, it's like, getting a recipe out of my mother's mouth is like pulling teeth out of a tiger's mouth. And the reason I say that, I think people think it means that it's because she's protective of her culinary secrets or something like that. And there is this part of her that she's a lot of times she's like, don't give it away yet because we have to open a restaurant. And she always like wants to open a restaurant. She's like, after she eats a recipe of mine that she likes, um, or we finalize a recipe, she's like, this is so good. You should open a restaurant. Um, and I think that that was, first of all, a barometer for when a recipe was finished. And she thought that it had to be at a restaurant. And then second, um, it was also just like, I, I think the real thing for me was she she was never afraid to give away her secrets. So unlike other moms, she's not um, she's not afraid to give, give away her, her, her secrets, her tips, because she's always been the best cook. Like she's in her community. She's always sort of been the, the one whose kimchi is on everyone's table. Um, she makes a lot of kimchi and then she, she always shares it with people. She's like, oh, Teresa needs this or Cecilia really likes this. Um, everyone has like Catholic names because it's Atlanta and it's a very like Catholic community. So when I say getting a recipe out of her is like pulling teeth out of a tiger's mouth. It, I mean more that she is a, a real liar. She like lies a lot. Um, and I think it's this, it was this really wonderful kind of moment in our lives where we found ourselves um, kind of turning our private into a very public thing. So these, these recipes, um, there was this sense that as we started developing that she wanted to the deception. Yeah, Eunice. I love this chat function, by the way. Um, we're totally reading them on the side, so feel free to chime in. I love the community here. Um, and I love not being able to see how many of you there are. Um, that makes me feel less anxious. Um, okay, anyway, so the, the, the tiger's mouth, my mom, she just, um, I, I would catch her in lies, like she would just be developing, she would be working on a, a recipe and trying to add fancy touches to it. And it took me a while to kind of get her to realize that we don't have to put in a, a front, like we're not, we're not presenting, we are presenting a very intimate part of our family, right? These, these recipes, but um, what people actually want to read, which is, I was trying to tell her sort of like as an editor was, which is where the hand comes in. That section is called the tiger in the hand and I'm the hand, she's the tiger, um, is that people want to see the food that we ate at home and the food that she cooked. And I think when you cook without an audience in mind, that food always tastes kind of better. And I actually feel this way as a developer. I found that in my New York Times job, for instance, that um, the dishes that I was trying to force didn't taste as good as the ones that were just my dinner. So you can kind of tell when the recipe does well, because it's often like a recipe that um, that was just part of my life. And then I go to Genevieve Co, my editor, I'm like, oh my God, I, I made this really delicious thing last night. Can we turn it into a recipe? And then we'll talk about it. And so there's, there's this I think I wonder if like a lot of writers and artists think about this, but you know, cooks are the same. It's um, when you aren't focused so much about audience, it, it tastes so much pure and more more honest. And so that that was my relationship with my mother working through this, and what I meant about um, the difficulties of working with a, with a source who who uh, doesn't always tell the truth. So there's, I guess that's an interesting way of conceptualizing it because it seems like part of it is uh maybe you're trying to put on a front for some imagined audience but part of it is also maybe a little bit of self-deception about mm -hmm. that you have to negotiate your around it as well is that maybe yeah i think so um there's a there's a sense with developing family recipes especially which are supposed to be private right where I 
I find myself um, deluding myself. I'm, I'm thinking about like Trick Mirror and Gia Tolentino's book, which is like right there on my bookshelf. I love that one so much. She kind of talks about this a lot. And I think there is this, um, there's this moment when you're developing a recipe that is that comes from real experience. Um, like for instance, my guacamole. I have been making this guacamole my whole life. It's super chunky, it's a lot of herbs. The cilantro is like half of the ingredient list. So it's almost like a, a salad leaf because I just love it like that. And um, and I was trying to write it down for, for a job like many years ago. And I had my measuring spoons and I was like trying to measure like the, the, the number of tablespoons of that diced jalapeno and, you know, trying to measure the salt. And I, I realized that it wasn't until I let go of the precision and kind of gave more wiggle room. So instead of a two tablespoons of um, diced jalapeno, I would say one large jalapeno diced, something like that. Um, it wasn't until I did that, that the um, recipe just started to actually taste like the thing that I was trying to, that I've been making my whole life. It's, it's really weird when you're, I totally saw my mother experiencing that throughout the process. Um, she's sort of like, what am I doing? Or she's like, is this what I do? I don't remember what I do uh, because when you're cooking for just yourself, it's it's a very natural thing. And so to to kind of try to approximate the thing that is real, but make it written down in, in measurements and with directions and a little clarity so that you could translate it for a home cook who's never had it. Um, it's a very difficult thing to do. And what it takes, what it requires is getting 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 rid of that um, that mirror or something like that. You just have to pretend like no one's watching kind of like this talk um I, I do love the chat but I love that I kind of can't see any of you so I have no idea who's out there and so I'm able to just talk to Alex like this and pretend that no one's here <laughs> <laughs> hi from well time Kate um so I think this discovery about the the idea of like how does one articulate the private recipe is actually like a really key part of uh not just um the recipes themselves but also like your presentation around it and the way that you talk about it and i feel like there's a very uh very relaxed approach that emerges um that's kind of soothing to be honest um but i uh i guess the next piece for me that i was curious about is I noticed that you really like maple syrup. And I wondered if you could talk about that as an ingredient in your relationship. You know, I'm just, I'm here in Maine. I grew up with like my cousin who has a sap house uh, is like a couple miles away. Sap, sap house is across the street from me in Vermont. Vermont yeah. maple syrup's kind of a big deal. Anyway, please elaborate. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I. <laughs> Maple syrup. Uh, with there's a maple syrup milk bread that um, you know everyone's very happy to make, but maybe once in a while I'll see a comment that's like, "Do you realize how much sap it takes to t <laughs> to boil down to make one cup of maple syrup?" And even my mom, uh, she learned how to make the milk bread recently. We made it together our, um, on my last trip there, and she was like talking to me over the phone and saying, "Hey, uh, Eric, the bread didn't really work. It, it kind of." It, it was a little tougher than I thought, or it didn't, it didn't work out. And she told me that she, she had replaced the maple syrup with like honey or something else. Um, or, or maybe only did like a quarter cup of maple syrup and the rest was sugar. And I was like, because that's like <laughs> so much of the bread, um, it provides moisture as well. And honey doesn't have that same moisture. And anyway, um, my mom's not really a recipe follower. So that's, that was a, that was a funny moment, but yeah, I, I totally, um, I think for me, it, it's that it was a pantry ingredient I kind of happened to have in my in my um, larder for a little bit, and then I I kept using it to sweeten things. And instead of a pinch of sugar, I was like, "What about maple syrup?" And I kind of I had honey, maple syrup, and brown sugar just kind of in my in my pantry while I was developing this book. And I found myself gravitating towards the maple syrup when I really wanted that. Um, that flavor. People mention agave all the time. Um, I'm not familiar with it. I haven't used it, but I think it works for for many for a lot of things. Um, but I I guess my other thing is in a cookbook, especially something that's like you know a contained piece um, that has like a pantry section. 
if I'm asking you to use one thing um, in one recipe, I want to give you many, many ways to use it in other recipes. And it's something that um, Nigel Lawson is always aware of. And, you know, I'll look back maybe in five or 10 years and be like, man, I was obsessed with maple syrup. That was weird. Um, and I, I love that about cooking. I found myself because you, I see that in Nigella's like 11, 12 cookbooks. Um, she has moments where she's obsessed with one ingredient and then she's always been obsessed with rhubarb. But, you know, there was a point where she used um, her mezzalula a lot. It's this like mezzaluna, mezzalula. It's a mezzaluna. Um, half, yeah. moon, half moon, yeah, half moon knife. Um, that's that's not an ingredient, but she she would use that to like clumsily chop the herbs. And, and now she just uses a knife. But um, I think... I love those physical things that mark time and mark um, moments in time. And, and my, like one nice example about this is um, I have this bacon and onion pasta on NYT cooking. It's a recipe that I really love because it it's, it's me in the present day, sort of remembering back when I would use herbs of Provence, chili flakes uh, and red vermouth together a lot. I don't know why. I just like always had them. And I happened to buy a, a jar of Herbs of Provence maybe that week um, with my like Food Network check. And uh, I just used it until it was out. And then I probably never bought it again. No, I, 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 I buy Herbs of Provence a lot. But when I made that pasta, when I used those ingredients again and I tasted that pasta. I was like, wow, this, this tastes like when I was like 21 years old. Um, and I, I love that flavor. And I was like, hmm, that did taste, that does taste good. It still tastes good still slaps as they say and so I think um I love that there are these ingredients that can can mark moments in time maybe I'm like intellectualizing it too much but I, I don't I, I I bet there will be a day when I like stop using maple syrup and I look back and I'm just like thanks Dennis man what a community <laughs> uh, but but you know another thing is maple syrup caramelizes that's kind of my obsession right now with it mm -hmm. maple syrup is this wonderful sweetener right. that has its own kind of sweetness that's um has back notes like it's a little smoky it's a little has some edge a little bitterness it's not just pure sweet it's also like a gentle sweet and so i i also i like that flavor but i also like that when you cook it it hardens things. It like really like caramelizes uh, croutons, for instance. So I have the zucchini panzanella that has a little maple syrup in the dressing, but also in the the crouton step. And there are a lot of people who are like, I don't know if I need that, and they skip it. And I'm and then but the people who do it, they're like, whoa, that was amazing. That texture. I was like, I know. And um and then there's another recipe where I could go on about maple syrup. I'll, I'll finish this soon. But but there's another recipe where you you steam eggs in the microwave, microwave steamed eggs that um, you douse with a little maple syrup, a little soy sauce and some chives. And that's the end of it. And without the maple syrup, you don't have that balance and you don't have that experience. And so I just like that this ingredient has so many physical states, liquid, solid, liquid and solid, I guess. Um, I've never tried like vaporizing it. And kind of in between, right? The caramelizing. Yeah. And there's an in-between where it's like chewy. And um, so anyway, I... With, with the bread, I had like a quarter cup and then I had a half cup and then my family just kept being like, just, just give it to us. And then I did like three quarter cup. And then finally I just did a full cup. And then that's the bread that everyone was like, finally, we can like taste the maple syrup and it tastes great. And so I think um, it's an obsession. It's a current obsession and it's lasted for about two years. Um, uh, who knows how long it lasts, but I, I just sort of like that. It's um, yeah, I, I, I consider it a, a little personal touch. I, I love maple syrup in my food. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like there's another piece of this uh, that I'd like you to tease out for the audience, which is there's a way in which the cookbook is also, I think, drawing from the kind of remarkable food resources of Georgia, right? right? Like as a state, and but also Atlanta specifically, maybe. Yeah. Um... You know, I I always tell the story because I don't know like who's seen what and, you know, I, but I say this every time because I want people to know that this book I was supposed to, my original, my original plan was to travel the country and kind of like interview other home cooks, other Korean American home cooks, cooks and try to create some kind of compendium. And it was, um, and Dennis is uh, pointing out 
another moment in which I used maple syrup. <laughs> Attacked. Just kidding. Um, it's really good in a pan sauce, um, especially with butter. It is everywhere. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, I was going to go interview people, and then the pandemic happened. So this book, which was horribly titled The Essentials of Korean American Cooking, um, it was maybe a much more boring book. It, it could have been good, um, but I ended up having to move back home, and I was I was back home for a very long time. And then so it, I had to turn a little more inward. It was more about my family. And then my family became the sources. But, um, you know, we were all in lockdown, right? And kind of terrified of leaving the house. But I would go on these like drives and I would sort of drive by different restaurants, many of which were closed at the time. But um, we would also order sushi. Like we would order, try to like help the businesses um, on Buford Highway, especially. Gangnam is a restaurant we grew up a lot with uh, a lot we we ate that a lot it's in the book the ibop the the flying fish roll rice in the book is inspired by a dish that I ate at that restaurant a lot as I was writing this book and really mining my past and developing recipes I found that I was really tapping into tastes of uh, Atlanta tastes of my childhood that um, some of which were that came from restaurants and and then I I think it was being in Atlanta for nine months as an adult, which ended up becoming a real bulk of what the essays were about, because it was just such a profound experience to be back home as an adult and to kind of look around myself and realize what a what an amazing Korean American community I grew up in, and um, and not just the food, but also the you know there's a Catholic church that I grew up in, and you know I still have to write a lot about that. There there are things that I haven't unraveled there, but um, in terms of food food and community anyway as an intro to you know this is my very first book so it just felt like the right thing to um sort of credit where inspiration was coming from and and it was so wonderful to have these moments of discovery re rediscovery really just real realizing that some of these things we ate in atlanta i took for granted growing up um i mean my brother and i both took for granted growing up and we would talk about these things at the dinner table. Like for instance, there's a hot wing that I haven't, I haven't written about yet, but um, I've talked about a lot of my little dinner conversations with my parents and my brother were about um, just my, my little theories. And one of my theories is that there's this hot wing in Atlanta. It's, it's super spicy, peppery, very vinegary. It's not a buffalo wing. Like the flavor profile is completely different. It's like drier, but um not the chicken the chicken is moist but you know the the coating is like drier and um you always had to have that with celery and carrots and, and and ranch not blue cheese and so this this kind of hot wing i i always took for granted we it always came with like fried rice you always ate it with fried rice and um my dad was sort of telling me about you know a couple of the friends who started that hot wing business and it was so it was cool to talk to him about this hot wing that I th we were realizing maybe didn't really exist outside of Atlanta, and I was able to do some very preliminary field field research. Field research is really just um, uh, me Instagramming a picture of the wings and being like, "Do you remember? The, did you have this growing up?" And then have a poll and it's very official, but it's a nice way to get like a little litmus test of um, this is just me. And um, you know, the comments were a lot of like, "Oh, we didn't have that." But um, the Atlanta people were like, oh, yeah, yeah, we did have that. Does that really not exist anywhere else? I'm like, yeah, it doesn't exist anywhere else. Or it's um, it's very particular to Atlanta for some reason. And my cousin Becky has a theory that's like, um, you know, she like she works with a lot of Mexican immigrants, um, like still. But even back then, her her dad was a contractor. So um, she's really in, she's she's really familiar with um with the Mexican immigrant community in Atlanta. And we were kind of talking about how, man, what if that it was like the fusion of the two sort of in those kitchens? Because, you know, the labor was often Mexican or Korean in these Korean wing shops. And many of which are closed now, but they, they keep popping up in other renditions. And, and then my dad's like, oh yeah, my, my friend started the very first one in 19 whatever. And I'm like, oh, can I call him? And he's like, yeah, I guess. And it's sort of, and then I actually wrote about lemon pepper wings, um, which is a, a separate flavor profile, but 
it turned out that the restaurant owner um, of the wing that I like the most, which everyone is going to want to know probably, Sumo and Hibachi Grill or something. Um, sorry, it's Sumo, Hibachi, and Grill. Sumo, Hibachi, and wings and grill or something like that but it's in petri corners and they make the best lemon pepper wing when i interviewed the guy at the very end he was like hey tell your dad i said i said hi um we're friends i was like what <laughs> so um you know that's the great thing about atlanta you just i'm just like a journalist and I'm kind of like just t treating him like a source and then the whole time he he like didn't reveal to me that uh, he knew my dad and my dad's like oh yeah, yeah that guy he's yeah he, he runs a lot of popping businesses in atlanta um and you know everyone knows my dad i'm like i'm kinky bum's son and um so it's sort of this wonderful community and it's the kind of reporting that I, I love seeing in some of my favorite fiction, like Annie Pruel, Annie Pruel, Pruel, I never knew how to say her name actually. Um, I love reading her, her writing about Wyoming and, um, and so I, I have found some of that, some of that discovery and some of that joy of, uh, you know, small town, um, you know, kind of like fact checking in while writing this book and it was about Atlanta and when I realized that this was a love letter to Atlanta as well, I, I, it just, I started to really um, be so proud of where I'm from. And uh, I think that's really a wonderful discovery when you no longer hate, you know, where you're from, because I think it, no matter where you, where you live or grew up, you, you're always trying to escape your past self. And I say it in the book, I think, but I just like, it's not that I didn't like Atlanta growing up. It's that I didn't like who I was back then, you know, and um, I wasn't, cause I was a fetus and, and now I'm a grown man and I wear blazers and um, yeah. And um, I also just wanted to, I don't know if anyone's here uh, who knows what this is a reference to, but I was in SF just last, just, just yesterday. And um, just crazy that I'm back in New York and this, sorry for this tangent, Alex. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to, uh, this, this, this girl wrote on my Instagram, Eric always looks like he's just woken up from a nap. And, um, and then I kind of like posted that and then, and then she, that girl showed up to one of my my events and gave me this shirt. So, just in case she's in the audience or someone's. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, Beautiful. I did just wake up from a nap because so. it's been a long <laughs> it's been a long week. You remember the first week, right, Alex? It's like yeah, on, in the debut book, it's like um. Anyway, no one ever tells you how crazy it is. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. Um. So is this a good time for you to read a little bit? Yeah, sure. I'm going to talk to everyone uh, about Eric reading a little bit from one of the first essays uh, in the book. It's, uh, the book is uh, populated with these, uh, these sections. I'll let you uh, finish explaining it. Why don't you set it up? Sure. Um, you know, thank you for coming to this virtual event. I, I really did want to go to Seattle, but um, you know, <clears throat> schedule wise, we were like, I'm going to make it out one day, but I did want to do something with book larder. And thank you, Alex, for joining, you know, saying yes, by the way. And, uh, and I like these virtual talks, because it's kind of a nice chiller time, like maybe I'm playing on your laptop while you're washing the dishes, or maybe, um, yeah, so I, I think like readings are something that I've always enjoyed. And I figured I would read from the book a little bit. Um, do you think I should start with the intro? Or is there something else you guys want me to read? I feel like this chat is, it's all yours. You can, you're cooking along. Nice. You just did the dishes, Emma. That's good. Yeah, we were thinking we'd read the intro because it's kind of like sums up the full like moment. Um, Alex, what do you think? Should we read the intro? There's also another essay in the end called Nest. That's like a little, it's about the kimchi fried rice. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, you're muted. The intro. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was hoping you wouldn't say that. Um, yeah, the intro always makes me cry. So it's sort of, um, I've practiced. I've, I've read it like a few times, you know, and there was supposed to be a whole book trailer and everything, but I just like never got through it. And so, <laughs> so I just posted the raw footage of that. Um, and that was like practice. So I'm going to do my best and I'll, I'll read the intro and it kind of sets up the book and okay, we'll, we'll go from there. <laughs> um, and I appreciate all the humor in the chat. I think humor is like, you know, life's greatest medicine. Okay. Okay, let's do this. Um, 
Oh yeah. The introduction is the very first page. It opens up with a photo of me in Niagara Falls as a, I don't know, five-year-old or six-year-old or something. I remember that. Um, it was so cold and I was like sucking on the, the little the little thing they give you. And I was like, why the hell are we so wet? <laughs> and why, why can't we go home? Anyway, okay. Can you tell I'm stalling? Okay. When I was 17 years old, I ran away from home. College acceptance letters had just come in and my mother, Jean, had torn into all of mine before I could come home from school that afternoon. I was so angry with her for opening my mail that I packed a bag in the middle of the night, took the car with the GPS and drove from our house in Atlanta where this story begins and ends to Nashville where my cousin's Hemi lived four hours Northwest. In the morning, when Jean saw that my bed was empty and my toothbrush gone, she called me over and over. In my very first act of rebellion as her son, I didn't pick up. I remember that trip to Nashville distinctly because Hemi and I cooked Cocovan together. By then, as an avid watcher of the Food Network, I had tried my hand at a variety of non-Korean dishes, mostly flash fries and quick pan sauces, but never a proper braise. It was liberating to braise chicken with red wine on Hemi's tiny stove, not least because that just wasn't how we cooked back in Georgia. My mother's Korean soups and stews were vociferously boiled. The meat made fall apart tender in stainless steel stock pots or burbling earthenware called dukbegi. When I was reading Crying in H Mart, I was like, um, not shocked, but uh, I smiled when I read basically the same phrase, earthenware called dukbegi. It's like that same phrasing's there. And I kept thinking like, that's so interesting. Like, you know, when you're writing as a Korean American, about a Korean thing in English, you have to like translate. And anyway, uh, Michelle's honor reference. Slow cooked dishes in general were a whole new frontier for me and wouldn't become a fixture in my home cooking until years later in New York, where I would eventually go to college, take an internship at the cooking channel and buy a yellow Dutch oven with my first paycheck. <laughs> I think the benefit of being home is that I, I like have everything with me. I'll show you. This is my yellow Dutch oven. It's called Alfred. It's a Fontanier. It's not even like a Le Cursé or one of those fancy ones. It was just the one that was the cheapest at Bed Bath & Beyond. And it's the one I use still. And it's perfect. And I've had it for like so many years. Anyway, oh, like six different New York apartments. A good investment if you like stews. Anyway. I've made many a cocovan in that. Okay, I'll continue and, and try not to interrupt. I'm just trying to ease the tension so I don't cry. Okay. But for now, at 17, tucked away in Semi's Tennessee bachelorette pad, I tasted freedom for the first time in my life. A vast world of pleasures had opened up to me. Pleasures that had until then been reserved for adults who get to cook whatever they want, however they want, in kitchens that aren't ruled by their parents. Oh, it's okay to cry. I read that in someone's book the other day. Okay. When I came home a few days later, Jean brushed it off, pretended it was a non-issue that I had run away, but she did bring it up at dinner that night. So did you have a good trip? Even then I could tell that she was practicing her loosened grip on me, her second son, the one who never got into trouble. Over a plate of her kimchi fried rice, which she had made for my homecoming and would continue to make for many homecomings to come, I told her how I'd, I had been feeling, paralyzed at that great nexus between childhood and adulthood. I ran away because I needed some space, I explained. Though I didn't say it at the time, she knew what I really meant. I ran away because I needed some space from her. This hurt my mother greatly, I could tell. But she smiled and nodded and listened anyway. Seeing that effort and the hidden worry in her face was enough to thaw my cold, ungrateful heart. I burst into tears and apologized. In many ways, I feel that I've been running away from home my whole life. I'm only just now as an adult, starting to slow down and find my way back to Atlanta, where I was born and raised, to understand its role in my overall story. After a lifetime of running around, 
I've come to appreciate the stillness of rootedness. It took spending more time too in the kitchen as a food writer and journalist, first as an editor for publications like foodnetwork.com and Savour, and now as a columnist for the New York Times to make me realize that we can never really run away from who we are, not easily anyway. This lesson was expounded for me during the COVID-19 pandemic when I moved back home for one year to work on this cookbook with my mother. I wanted to write down her recipes, but as I got deeper and deeper into the project, I came to the conclusion that my recipes are an evolution of her recipes. And the way I cook now is and will forever be influenced by the way she cooks. This book then tells the constantly mutating story of how I've come to understand my identity, not just as Jean's son, but also as someone who has always had to straddle two nations, the United States where I'm from and South Korea where my mother is from. Too often I have felt the pangs of this tug of war. Am I Korean or am I American? Only recently have I been able to fully embrace that I am at once both and neither and something else entirely. I am Korean American. As is often the case with cooking, there are many answers to be found in the kitchen. The recipes in here explore that tension and the ultimate harmony between the Korean in me as well as the American in me. Through the food my family grew up eating and the food I cook for myself now. At the end of the day, this is all for me, food that tastes like home. From the very good kimchi jjigae that fuels my weary soul to the crispy lemon pepper pugogi that feeds my friends when they come over, or the gochugado shrimp and roasted seaweed grits I make for myself whenever I'm feeling especially homesick for Georgia and for my mom. This book navigates not only what it means to be Korean American, but how through food and cooking, I was able to find some semblance of strength, acceptance and confidence to own my own story. This story is mine to be sure, and my family's, but it's also a story about the Korean American experience, one that in the history of this country is often never at the center. It's about all the beautiful things that come with being different and all the hard things that come with that too. My hope is that in reading this book, you'll see yourself in it, whether you're Korean, Korean American or neither, whether your family immigrated to Atlanta, Los Angeles or Little Rock, because at the heart of this book is really a story about what happens when a family bands together to migrate and cross oceans in search of a new home. It's about what happens when, after so much traveling and fighting and hard work, you finally arrive. There's a pivotal moment that occurs whenever I'm on a long drive home from somewhere distant. The blurry picture starts to come into focus. I can let down my guard and turn off my GPS. The roads are familiar again. I don't need a robot telling me about my own city, my own street, my own hometown. But sometimes after that long drive, I'll forget to turn off the GPS because my mind is wandering. Or maybe I'm listening to a really good song or an especially juicy podcast. And as I roll into my mother's driveway, eager to walk through those doors and crash into my old bed, He'll talk back to me. Welcome home. <laughs> that was beautiful. You did a great job. Thank you. That was better than before. So it's getting better, easier, easier, and easier. <laughs> I mean, I think there's a lot of us in the audience who know how honor it is to talk about being Korean American like this, um, even now, especially because like. You know, for such a long time, I think it's lessening a little bit, but um, such a long time, uh, it would be the case where as, as a Korean American, you'd be treated like a kind of ignorant Korean. <laughs> like, okay. um, yeah. And as like somebody who didn't really have, uh, you know, much to offer also to either conversation and uh, and so to to just sort of say it the way you do, I think really is uh, something beautiful and to sort of represent it also in this elaboration across the chapters in the book. 
So yeah. Thanks for saying that. I I totally know what you mean. It's um thank you. I, I totally know what you mean. It's um growing up it was always weaponized. Like you're a Twinkie. And then when I was gay, it was like you're a Twinkie Twink. Anyway, um it was just like, you know, <laughs> sorry, it was this thing where um Korean Americans who were more Korean than you, they would speak um in Korean around you and all of us speaking broken Korean, by the way, none of us were like that good at it. And um, I just remember that feeling so violent, like we're in a setting where it's just like friends hanging out or something. And then suddenly someone, someone like breaks out the full Korean. Um, and I'm okay with that. I, I can, I can like stumble through some Korean and, and I understand it, but um, we're all Korean. We all speak English here. We're all like Americans. So I, I remember it being used as a weapon um, of Koreanness, and to be less Korean was uh, worse, and whatever that means, less Korean. And I think so. Th th the intro is something I wrote at the very end of the book. Um, I open at the close. I love Harry Potter. Sorry. I think because the epilogue was originally going to be the intro, and it was it was just ridiculous. Like you know, um, it had like all these Harry Potter references and Kiki delivery, Kiki's delivery service references and. It was just, um, it was, the epilogue was a different thing um, before the edits and before it was, at, it was, it, we ended up putting it at the end, but the intro happened like, I don't know, in like 30 minutes. It was just like, not 30 minutes, but you know, it just happened so naturally at the end of the process, because I think I had to go through the whole process of writing it to like work through what exactly I wanted to say as a Korean American or an American writing about Korean food. Um, and I also like, went through a lot of uh, internet bullying, you know, just people being like, oh, I'm Korean and this is not Korean. And um, so then I got to a point where I, I gained some confidence. I wrote some more Korean pieces and I was like, F that. <laughs> so I, and I felt really, and then it became a rally cry or rallying cry. I'm really bad at idioms, immigrant parents. Um, it became this thing where I, I had like something really political, like specific to say. Where identity is um, where identity is policed by my own people. That was, that's insane, and that's something that happens um, to a lot of people, unfortunately. But so I, I, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that I think we need to stop weaponizing, you know, authenticity against our own people. That's so crazy, and we, you know, Korean Americans can come together and, and do talks like this and. I still can't believe I'm like chatting with Alex Chi. This is, uh, we have to like meet in person another time and just over a drink and not an audience. But <laughs> this is a really um, wonderful, wonderful experience. And especially all the Koreans in the chat and all the non-Koreans, but thank you, you know, Tessa for sharing your story. And I, I just, I read these DMs all the time and the good outweighs the bad, but, um, and, and I, I don't wanna make this negative. Like this, this book is for everyone, it's for, it's for um, you know those of us who are looking for that kind of. It's not just it's not necessarily clarity. You don't need clarity, but there was this acceptance that happened at the end of writing this book that I just wanted everyone else to feel somehow. Um, I don't know that, and and part of doing that is is through through the food. It's through cooking uh, dishes from your past, and it's just an incredible feeling to be able to or to feel that you've somehow fused use the past version of yourself with the present and just kind of accepted um, all versions of yourself. And uh, it's a really beautiful experience, really life-changing. And um, I was like, how do I put that into words? <laughs> yeah, you did a great job with it. So we are going to jump into the questions, which uh, started to add up. Um, let's see. Allison asks, congratulations on your very first book. What are you snacking on tonight? <laughs> and did you experience any disconnect from your work slash your mother's recipes in the mechanical process of deliberating a published cookbook? Oh, great questions. Um, first of all, I'm definitely gonna be snacking on these incredible chocolate chip cookies. They're like chocolate chunk cookies that a baker made for me, um, Ben Wiener. He's my friend, Jesse Shevchik's like, you know, colleague at the kitchen. And 
he's a huge Bravo fan. Sorry, this is like a really long answer for the, <laughs> the, the simple part of the question, but he's a Bravo fan. And so I was like, I'm going to be on Andy Cohen. Do you want to, you want to join me like in the green room and stuff? And he was like, oh, and he, um, and he brought like profiteroles and like homemade profiteroles and homemade chocolate chunk cookies that have a little bit of freeze dried, like raspberries in them. Whew, like perfect amount of salt, man. I don't know how to explain when you've had a real baker's baked goods. Like I'm not a baker, but if you've had like Jesse Chef Chef's cookies, Ben Wiener's cookies, Aaron McDowell's pies, like they taste like they taste so good. So different than anything else. And I just, I don't know, like we take for granted when these like really talented bakers are, are on our screens, we're just like, oh yeah, yeah, they're baking. But it's actually like, they're there because they're so good at it. And there's a difference in flavor. That's how I feel about like, you know, my mom's food and like savory cooking, but um, you know. Anyway, sorry, that was the answer to that. <laughs> so I'm, gonna, I'm excited to have that with some tea, probably burdock root, because it's, it's getting late over here. Um, did you experience any disconnect from your work, your mother's recipes and the mechanical process over here? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Did you? Oh, it went away. Okay. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, I, uh, I you can click on answered and you can you see. Know, it. No, not at all. You know, I don't know if it's a disconnect. It was more of like there's this thing that happens when you're trying to chase a memory. Um, let's say you go back home and your aunt's whatever casserole that you remember loving as a kid, you ask her to make it for you again or write it down, and then you make it. You're like, whoa this doesn't taste <laughs> like I remember it tastes like that yeah <laughs> yeah and you know it doesn't mean she's a bad cook or anything like that it just means that your taste buds change every seven years you know they literally I mean I read that once I think there might be some actual scientists here but because um and then so the book process kind of became this journey towards chasing the memory more than like the actual like thing because sometimes the actual thing you've like outgrown or like Dunkaroos they don't taste as good anymore but it, it is that like chicken or egg thing where you're like, <laughs> Alex just had a, you remember Dunkers? Yeah, you just have this, um, that sometimes you have that moment where you're like, did the thing get worse or did I just change? And the answer is almost always you've changed. So, but your memory hasn't changed. So it's nice to be able to approximate the memory and short into the present. I believe in, you know, bringing the past into the present to, to resuscitate it. That's kind of what this book was about. And um, so, yeah, there was disconnect. There were there were disconnections that I tried to connect. I think that was the purpose of the book. Thank you for that lovely question. Yeah, I feel like chase, you're always chasing a memory when you cook. Uh, I, and I realized something recently, which is, I think we talked about this in your bulgogi recipe presentation on the times, but like, I feel like every time I make bulgogi, it tastes different. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm always like, why is it different this time? What did I, because I always think I do the exact same thing. Right? Yeah. Cooking is like that, right? And that's why it's like, it's very interesting to, uh, I want to say that the recipe is an approximation. It's like an attempt to approximate and measure something that is immeasurable. I think, you know, certain tastes are immeasurable and that's why they're so wonderful. Um, but we can try, we can try. All right, Lauren Kimball asks, could you please share what you both have been reading and loving lately? Uh, we have a lot of questions, so I'm gonna actually make this your spotlight dance. What have you been reading and loving lately? I'll put my answer in the chat. Oh, oh man. I haven't been loving it. Oh, maybe I shouldn't say it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, maybe don't say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I won't say that. Uh, Okay, so I'm working on a collection of essays right now, and I've been loving um, Alex Chee's autobiography. I, I've been just like, you know, how to write an autobiographical novel, and um, Gia Tolentino's Trick Mirror, sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you. It's just like, I'm looking at these essay collections by Asian people and um, wonderful Asian writers who write about culture and, and memory and, and tonally so different, right? Those two are so different, but I'm... I'm still inspired by both collections so much and so yeah I'm, I'm sort of I'm doing a lot of research right now um, you know I think uh, if you were to take a master class on how to write a collection of essays those two are definitely you know two that I would consider um, on the curriculum on the syllabus syllabus so um, 
yeah I, I'm really uh sorry I, I, I don't want to embarrass you Alex but like <laughs> um just I was reading the curse on the train and um I love what you do with language there just um this notion of access according to language is something I thought about a lot while writing this book because a lot of the um the Korean words or Korean techniques didn't really have that many romanizations on the internet or like in you know so I, you kind of have to like sometimes make it up as you go and that that experience is something I feel like you um you you depicted in that story but it was also just a reminder of how beautiful um I hope you don't, I hope this, if you take this as a compliment, but like, I'm, I grew, I, I was kind of brought up by MFA uh, writing workshops, not, I didn't take like MFA classes, but I, um, I was a creative writing major at NYU and I, um, the program era fiction is like, you know, something that started, I don't know, 60s, 70s, something like that. And that tone of, of writing, it's just so, um, I don't know. It's so gentle and uh, it's so, you said gentle, you said soothing, I guess, um, when you were talking about um, Korean American, but I felt that way reading reading through your, your work. And I think that's something that I, it's just nice to experience that again. It's like, that's the kind of stuff I read a lot in college. And it's something that I um, really, I don't know. I'm trying to, I'm trying to find some kind of balance uh, between the, like having those moments and then, but you know, I also love um, all of Brian Washington's writing, and um, and now he's a he's a columnist for the New York Times Magazine, which is really lovely, and we get to read him write about food in a very like a very official way. Not that he was doing it unofficially, but my favorite kind of food writing I've always said is um, is maybe by uh, like non food writers. Um, I wonder if he would call himself a food writer. I should just ask him probably. But anyway, um, there's this kind of program era writing that I think is is really really beautiful and I'm inspired by that right now I think well thank you for the compliment I appreciate it um do 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 let's see all right I just got your book and cannot wait to cook from it. This is Hannah. Do you have any recommendations for recipes in it? To get me started. Is there like a recipe that's like good maybe for somebody who's not so confident in their cooking or like? Yeah. So, you know, the book is kind of, um, I don't want to sound too like, but um, I, I do think it's like in chronological order in a way, a little bit like, so the first chapter is TV dinners, and it's sort of mimicking the kind of cooking that I did as, as a kid. Um, I mean, I wasn't like gochujang butter glazing ribeye steaks at 13 years old or anything, but I just mean that, um, you know, the TV dinners are all weeknight dinners. They're all very quite simple and, and quick, and they're also just really... Um, uh, they're the kind of food that is like high reward for low effort. So that's something that's like a nice thing to cook first, I think, like the toasts, for instance, that kind of gives you a flavor profile that you'll find throughout the book. There's a gochujang butter radish toast that shows you like what happens when you you put these Korean chilies with something soft like butter and um, soft in flavor, I, I mean, and then there's like the, the seaweed avocado toast with like the roasted seaweed came and sesame oil and, and and that is a flavor that you will find all throughout the book. I love kim. I use it a lot. There's a whole essay that's dedicated to that. Anyway, so yeah, I think like the toasts and the there's like a pizza that's really, really wonderful because you just um, you use bottled ranch. And, <laughs> and I love anything that uses bottled ranch because I don't know. I think there's nothing wrong with Hidden Valley. I love it. Um, and uh, and that, that, that pizza is really delicious. And it's something that my mom made for herself a lot throughout the pandemic. She, after I developed that recipe, she was like, man, man, I love this. And so she just kept, she kept making it. And it's a really delicious, uh, it was fun to watch her sort of experiment with it. And she started adding, you know, cherry tomatoes and whatever was in her garden at the time. And the, the premise is the same. It's ranch is the white sauce for the bottom and then it's mozzarella and then um, whatever vegetables you have. And then when you bake it and you, you can dip it in the it's a black pepper honey, which is something I learned 
uh, I learned in Georgia, there was this fried chicken that I really loved that was, you know, some other than just honey and black pepper, nothing else. And, uh, and it really worked. It was really delicious. And, and then anyway, those are some ideas, I, I think. Uh, let's see, Eric, did your relationship with your mom change or evolve while you were home as an adult, having been on your own for so long and through recipe development? I feel like this is the whole book in a way, but anyway, if you have a shorter answer. Um... No, it's a good question. Um, I feel like in a way, um, thank you, Michelle. That's actually my, old, I'm not to embarrass her, but <laughs> That's my old boss for Food Network. Um, yeah, man, I I think when I think back on when I was like, you know, her 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 digital manager at Food Network as a uh, in my early twenties, it was um early twenties anyway, whatever. Sorry, um, making it weird. Um, I before the book, I wasn't really cooking with her. I wasn't really like, I was I would come home every like Christmas or Thanksgiving and. And the, the whole thing would be like, so what did you learn this year? And I would show her, oh, I've been obsessed with this weird like pea and mint salad or something or an avocado thing. Or I'm really interested. I, I had a phase where I was doing a lot of popovers. So I ta taught her how to do popovers. And so it was always sort of like I was coming back from like, I don't know, abroad or something it was really just New York. And I would I would cook her something and be like and, and she would add it to her repertoire and I'm always surprised at the things that she still cooks from from a long time ago. But um, so this was a really nice moment for and and it's it's because I didn't I took it for granted, right? I took her cooking for granted because she she was always going to be alive. She's always gonna be able to cook me this food. It was like the severity of the pandemic, I think, and the losses that my family experienced, you know, during all that, where I was and you know it timed with a book deal that I was tasked to write down some family recipes and um, so that was that was very new to go through her cooking and I love explaining it like this which is um, the thesis of the book is to write down your family recipes before it's too late and what I mean by that is when you write down your family recipes uh, maybe it's like a favorite dish that your mother cooks for you or and maybe maybe your mother's not here with us anymore that's okay too you can always like chase that taste memory it might take a few more tries but um, what you're doing is you're writing down a doc like a document of of um, a very specific experience, a culinary experience. And, and so the thing that changed with, was I think a lot of empathy, mostly, she, you know, she's my mom, she always had empathy for me, but I think uh, my empathy for her grew a lot. And I, um, so I would, I would make her food, you know, later after, after learning it from her, I would like, it was, we sort of like did a lot, of, it was like an assembly line, she would like, work on that recipe and then kind of write some stuff down and I would watch her and then I would try it. And then I would be like, well, have you considered this? Let's fix it, let's do that. And then I would help her like make the recipe a little more like usable. And, but in doing that, what I really learned as a child, like as a child of, as a child, but also like as a child of um, a mom is that um, you really, you learn all the little things that they do, uh, that they take their time with. It's like, um, you know, I'm like, you did this? Like every time you made this dish, like you made this dish so much, it takes, this is such a pain in the ass. Like, she's like, yeah, I know. And it's just like, and you know, that's, man, that's love. It's like, uh, it's like, it doesn't matter how long something takes. Um, I think my version of that for my family is the milk bread because it takes a fucking long time. Sorry, it takes a long time. Um, I'm so sorry. I'm really, I'm, I'm usually a lot better at that, but <laughs> thank you for that question. <laughs> Uh, let's see, I'm going to sneak one more in. Um, has the pandemic impacted the way you write about and share food, whether it's mindfulness of grocery shortages or the consequences of an abundance of leftovers? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, you know, especially at work, you know, we're, we're always trying to I don't know, like, I, there are things in this book, and a lot of this book is an, a document of um, the way my family eats and cooks, and so I had a little freedom, and also, um, you know, I knew that this book, even though it was written during the pandemic, it wouldn't continue to live, you know, it would continue, I knew that it would continue 
to live outside of the pandemic. So, um, but when it comes to, you know, like a daily job where you are developing recipes, um, I'm always thinking about the reader. And so service is really important to me. And so, you know, there are things that I don't do as much. Um, I don't really develop short rib, rib recipes as much. Um, I think, yeah, we're always thinking about cost and, and price and prices and um, supply chain, also climate. Um, so it's a big part of the thought process because, you know, the recipe, I'm not someone who's just like the recipe comes from within. <laughs> I think that's BS. Um, I'm always thinking about the end result. And, you know, of course it doesn't always like, doesn't always pan out that way. You, you, you think through everything you're trying, you're trying to make it really easy for the reader and then they still make it really hard for themselves. They're like, well, I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to do it like this. And that happens a lot. And, um, but there, there's a lot of thought going into, um, time and space. I think that's really important. And, um, also it's also, I, I'm, I'm someone who is living in this small apartment in New York. I do my own grocery shopping. Like I, you know, I, I'm also thinking about it. Um, and a lot of the best, my favorite recipes are the ones that just come out of, uh, just regular life. And that involves often just this little stainless steel table in my kitchen that doubles as a dining table with my partner. And also, um, you know, uh, where I chop onions and where I, um, make milk bread. So yeah, thank you for that question. And, um, you know, I, I, I copied and pasted all these questions. I'm going to maybe answer them on Instagram or something and, you know, make sure it's, everyone has their answer and I'll try to be funny and make it entertaining with a lot of graphics. <laughs> I'll, I'll spend like the next few uh, few minutes doing that. Hit on a question is a good one. <laughs> oh Wait, yeah, I uh, want to see the answer to that one too. Yeah. Any favorite <laughs> food from a particular K drama? Yeah, mm. looking forward to that answer. <laughs> I think we all are. Thank you so much, Alexander and Eric. This was so great. Um, and Eric, I will also send you the chat afterwards so that you can see sort of all the comments that came up that you might've missed because there were some really great ones in there. So yeah, thank and you Alex, much. you'll get that too. So um, thank you so much everyone for tuning in. Um, Eric, congratulations on the book. Someone asked in the chat about the recording. Yes, it will be up um, in the next day or so on the Book Larder YouTube channel. So you can watch this again and share it with friends. Um, this was just such a delightful way to start the week. Um, thank you so much, both of you. I, Eric, congratulations. Please come to Seattle anytime. You can stay here if you want. This is like a okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Alexander, you too. Please come to Seattle. <laughs> And thank you, everyone. Have a lovely evening and everyone stay safe, safe and healthy and have fun cooking Korean American. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.